Hi, everybody. Um, welcome. We're going to get started. We're going to also let folks kind of continue to filter in. But I'm Kyle DeCoyen. I'm the executive director of the Poetry Project. And I'm really happy and excited and grateful that you're here tonight. And I'm grateful that we're here with um, Paul Legault, Clara Mushki, and Laura Mimosa Montes, as well as Sarah Jane Stoner, who will deliver a guest introduction for Laura. Um, just a few housekeeping sort of things. Um, Corey, uh, our wonderful colleague, is going to enter into the chat um, some kind of FAQ type stuff for Zoom. Uh, you're welcome to leave your cameras on during this event if you'd like, but I do just want to note that the event is being recorded. So if you'd prefer to not be seen, um, you may want to switch off your camera by clicking the little uh, icon in the lower left-hand corner of Zoom. Um, you can also access a live transcription of this event by clicking the uh, the little bar in the top left corner that says uh, live on custom live streaming service. Um, I'm going to resist the usual introductory impulse to frame the work of these poets within any context of aboutness, because if anything, I think they are each differently engaged in poetic projects of unraveling or complicating or drawing attention to the artifices and compositions of what we perceive as narrative or memory or history. And when the maneuvers are as brilliant and original as they are with these poets, how could we reduce our reading and listening to anything as straightforward as about? Um, I do find though some shared direction of destabilizing force toward place. The hagiographies of place, our own location within or along or separate from place. And this leads me to open as we do all our readings with a reflection on where we are. Under different circumstances, we would be presenting this event from St. Mark's Church in the Bowery, our venue and the place where I'm speaking from tonight is built upon unceded indigenous lands, specifically the territory of the Lenape people. St. Mark's is the oldest site of continuous institutional religious worship on the island of Manhattan. It's the burial place of Peter Stuyvesant. It's a church whose first congregants were recorded slaveholders and colonizers and it's imperative that we reckon the language work we present within this very specific lineage of violence. We recognize the continual displacement and violence perpetrated against indigenous people and people of color by the US and are aware that these kinds of acknowledgements can be misused as stand-ins for actual decolonization work, which is something for us to bear in mind as we go forward in our ongoing commitment to accountability reparation and equity. We continue to surface new questions and considerations all the time in our praxis of that commitment. And I'm gonna ask Corey now to share in the chat our current language on safer space. We've got a really wonderful group of people holding together all of the different digital scaffolding of this event and they'll be keeping an eye on everything, but if you do experience any unwanted communications from a guest in this Zoom, you can chat someone identified as staff and we'll get it sorted out quickly. Um, we usually set up the chairs together and put them away in the parish hall at St. Mark's. And I find that even as we gather in these more remote grids, uh, our community is still finding ways to make and hold very special listening space together. So thank you for being with us and for figuring it out with us. We've made all of these online programs free and we've also continued to pay poets and artists for their readings, performances, teaching and writing. So if you feel moved to support these folks and are 
humble, enduring cultural anti-enterprise. Um, Corey is also placing a link to donate to the project in the chat. Okay, on to our poets. I'll be introducing Paul Legault and Claire Mushki tonight. And then after Claire's reading, Sarah Jane Stoner will deliver a guest introduction for Lara Mimosa Montes, who will close the night. Um, sometimes working at the Poetry Project is a little bit like seeing the sausage factory of poetry or literary culture. Part of what I love about Paul Legault's work is that I think he presents this very delicious counter alembic to all of the stultifying, calcifying elements of academy, scholarship, appointments, and awards. The various stuff that does materially shape the literatures we find ourselves in some relation to. I love his resistance of fixity and givenness and the way his poems sort of raise an eyebrow with scheming for some kind of otherwise. His newest book, The Tower, is a translation of Yeats's The Tower and follows some of the fabric of his earlier works. The Emily Dickinson Reader, an English to English translation of the complete poems of Emily Dickinson. Self-Portrait in a Convex Mirror 2 and Lunch Poems 2. Though I would also say his first books as well, the Madeline poems and the other poems. What is translation? What are the subjective semiotic contextual materials of communication or who is it who's speaking at all? What is a voice inside the form or the residual forces of reading that bear upon a text over time? There is this material accumulation of a culture and there is the language of the material which sits at a sort of precarious fulcrum of thing and not. From the titular poem, quote, things are constantly things and constantly saying, let us happen so we can increase as a culture. Another thing I like or think about this work is that pleasure prevails so often over meaning, meaning in its signified and functional sense when the poet gets to this project of co-voicing. Talking, kissing, coupling, loving, everything Legault writes has this beautiful and original quality of adhering. And it is a great pleasure now to welcome him to the Poetry Project. Thanks, Kyle. Um, I love the Poetry Project. I'm really happy to be here with all of you because it quickly becomes apparent that the Poetry Project is made up of people and this event is made up of people the same way. So it feels like a real place. Um, I, I also want to thank um, Roberto and James and Corey at the project for hosting us and um, my fellow readers, Lara and Claire for reading. Um, yeah, I'm thrilled to be here. And I'm going to read from this book of poems called The Tower. Um, it came out in April. Uh, yeah, so we were all inside and on Zoom, and here we are again. Um, but I wrote it. Uh, I like I wrote it in 2014, and 2013, and 2015, and then in 2019, and all these years that um, that that add up to now. Um, and it's, I don't know. I I wrote it. It's based on Yeats's The Tower, which is this like his best book. Um, it has some of his great, greatest poems and all my poems are based on Yeats's, but they're also just mine. Um, and I'll read one. It's called On a Picture of a Cowboy by Ron Tarver. You're riding through Philly in 1993 in a museum. Red shutters, white brick. You put on a white hat. You make a decision. Unwearied eyes upon pigs. Nobody is fitter to keep watch than you, cowboy. Philadelphia loves being alive and freedom and wild horses. Wild horses, they live in a few wild places. 
Wild horses never drag nothing. I loved you better than my soul. I forgot how far Saturn is. I forgot how many moons it has. Seven times you is a place. Into your 14 arms, the police nuzzle their little deer mouths. Dear mouths of the police, say there is an apology in a circular letter immediately to be read, if possible, everywhere. I keep watching you through your body cam. Though I can't see you, or sometimes you're just a hand, I know where you go. Stand down. My poetry can be so white. FTP. And I was thinking of time because um, this next poem that I wrote is called 2020, which is uh, not when I wrote it. I wrote it years ago and in the in the vein of Yeats, uh, who is sort of took this role of like a prophet. I feel like a poet and a prophet are sort of, they work, um, they work at the same job, but I guess this poem might be prophetic. It's just interesting to read it now. You can, you can, um, you can tell me if it predicted now, or if this is just like writing about the future. Now we're living in it. 2020. One. 2020 is the arbitrary number times counted up to. There's more to see, but she stopped for a year to think by the water. What's the difference between beach music and Bach? It depends on what you're wearing. Barely anything is the perfect look. I keep thinking you said something else. What's your favorite skincare destination? Your granddaughter's name is Verizon. She was in that beautiful TV show it is an anonymous runway tonight. Sometimes when I go out onto it, I want to distinguish myself like how I wish I could turn on my italics, but in real life, really leaning in like I'm a good listener with bad hearing. My eyes are bigger than my hands can sew. Do you think I should do something about that? Maybe there are mandrakes after all, though they're all dead or liminally existent like an advertiser in the garden branding the roses. Make it rain cash like petals on a wet black bough. I dreamt I was at a Korean spa in Rio. I think a gnat just went into my eye on purpose. Dragons are so in right now. We got pierced in a secret place called the mall. Protest is an adaptive response to how killing someone is like yelling forever. Suddenly all I can think about is one direction, up and how things should always go that way, like a plant. My concealed weapon is time. I need you to balance my power systems. I want you to meet the vegetable I invented. This vine jewel emits as from a godly source, the backyard. Its properties of alchemy include minor fruit necromancy, satanic doodlings, and a deadly poison. Americans are immune to it via ghost vitamin the Founding Fathers deliver to them daily in an old version of light. Fact. American sunlight is strongest in Puerto Rico. Fact. Eve's apple is probably a tomato. Leave it there like a delight and then return, young pilgrim, only to find it again, laid out, what the sun made with its helpers. Nature's a bad baker. Everything's about distribution. My name is Monsanto and I'm post earth. I live mostly on the moon and in St. Louis. I guess that makes me bispherical. Two, a wing makes these parts of flying, a shining web, a floating ribbon of milk. A mother makes these parts of life like a God makes being a badass its thing. Here's your elevator and its attendant opening out into the penthouse of basic existence. They ain't paying you to drink, Krishna, but it's do or die. I absorbed her entire life force in self-defense. The whole thing's written except for this part that you can actually see. Three, I left my golden bell somewhere, probably among all these pomegranates. Your hair is so good right now, Persephone. 
I hear there's a temple in your locks that you have to be a shampoo to get into. The myth of you is stuck on repeat. The underworld is an animated gif of something the world makes up here. Zeus is most definitely an asshole. Weather only bought a timeshare. Your mom ran around the earth with torches, like if the whole Olympics were a mother. Hades wants a non-disclosure agreement. There are these seeds that grow into time, months of it, and then you get out of hell like a bad situation. Girl, both hit it and quit it. I think this is a superfood. Saya Nova, I name you the emperor of naming the color of things exactly as they are. So what's red in the complete dark? There's this strange root that's dug in. Glow like a fat bug, nocturnal plant. Say, I like the pageantry of when they bring us up from the ground and say, I see you there. Not what you are the root of, the way color makes things seen. Is it from nothing? Night vision is like having visions. My eye cones are filled with the moon. Bats make things seen to sound. I'm wearing an LBD to the party. Basic or not, I'm well lit. Four, I move around a lot, but I'm mostly from the sea. Heaven sent its messengers again. You're the Frank to my ocean. You are the sea of fruit to my sea of water. Five, the temperature of yellow can affect you. Tastes turned into this turning over of the exact thing you encountered at the beach. They built bunkers underneath paradise. If fruit could bear arms, this apple's packing. Everyone is here. There is a feathering that pineapple does to flavor. It's like bearing a time capsule and opening it simultaneously just to mark the new new year. Maybe Neptune invented the Kraken as a kind of preemptive sculpture. Medusa gives good face. Ice makes walking hard, but walking on water pretty easy. That's only one way to be a god. Make the rain into a complicated nebbiolo and drink it with your friends. Like everything, tax the rich, pool our resources, learn to swim, maybe forget how to be a god sometimes, and then sometimes make everything stop. Six, the magicians under the blanket your delicate ear is carefully garlanded. The sage is on fire is the message the sage being on fire signals to you in smoke, like how smoke can signal a word like smoke. What happened to Florida? Let's be in touch wherever. Whatever happens, you need to grow up from the earth and shake flavor out from under its green cushion. Wood feather, what wound bird unwound its spool into what leaf thing you are? It was Sage with her wide eyes in the herbarium. Sage, the Gemini, knows she's going to shake it like a green bell. Sage draws beautiful things like a printmaker. Sage draws evil spirits from the body. Lana Del Rey's mystery illness is that she's made of money. I want to be as naked as Johnny Cash in a pile of cash in heaven in spring. Um, I like having you here. I wish I can see all of you, sort of. Your beautiful boxes. Um, thank you for joining me. I'll read two more poems from the tower, and then um, and then something else. I'll tell you about it. This poem's called "Emotional Intel." The difficulty of everything is always there. Staying hard is a way of staying easy. Weather is a full body body suit. I'm glad I'm not water in outer space. Crystals are what weather looks like on the inside. I wanna be locked in the museum overnight in a way that I now realize is erotic. I'm as lost in the archive as the archive. If you look hard enough, things move, and it's like you made them do that. Try you, for example, and you will, though the reason that's true is still incommunicado as an avocado. 
I place my seed on the windowsill. When it sprouts, I place it in the wild. Everything changes everything. You can hit the jackpot from behind. Can I turn the light off? Hold on. Where's my phone? Look something up. I'm, my phone's right here. Um, I have a poem in here, and it's for um, this man who I married. And I hope, I, I like, I feel like he's, one thing I like about him is he's, he always like blushes when I mention, when I um, give him shout outs. So I can picture him blushing in the other room. <laughs> um, but he's also born on the day of the dead, which, um, so we always celebrate his birthday by dressing up. And this poem is called Dia de Muertos which is coming up. Halloween stops at midnight, but we're still in costume, as is the custom. I think of undressing you like a ghost at the potter's wheel, but alive. I settle for one button and un undo it. There is no threatener to the rich in beauty except themselves, and what else, except death, or except deciding to enter into a setting imbued with the potentiality that you could be mauled. Break out of Wall Street, broke as a bull in a Chinatown lunch spot. I order kanji. I break down grass in each of my stomachs. There is no death like death. All these other kinds live. We're all little Britney inside. That's how I'll come back. I wish for you to tell me what to do dead genie. I need a mind that doesn't stop thinking. I just passed a store called Today. One version of paradise alters itself to fit out the gate. Dead royalty's always been classy. There's always help for a widow's son, Prince Charming. Just ask. Nobody knows what's good for you, especially yourself. Hit the gas and the brakes at once. Hit me with a single white glove twice. I can see the gun in the mirror. Dying so normal now. Everybody's doing it. I don't care what your name is, Candy, Storm, Princess, Harley Quinn. The grapes rotted in, the, in their cedar. My drag name is The Moon. Night is repetitive for a reason. I'm just another ghost on ecstasy. There's a clock face on the dance floor. Spirit guide, where did you get to? No, let me guess. Ancient Egypt, ancient Rome, or humanity's future planet? Seldomly, Earth fills me with whole thoughts. I feel pulled up like papyrus from the Nile. Write your number on the top of my hand. I will count up to it. Let's do a deck in the backyard this summer together. I love great timing. The more you save, the more you can do with what you save from the great fires. They call this a circle when everything's the same distance from the point, which means there is one. Harps announce you like a new text from you. Death appears as a sound at the window, revving through the red light, mufflerlessly. I used to shoot down helicopters in the jungle. Was that a ghost who said that or was it me? Whenever death happens, I'm like, Again, when we went to see where Michael was shot for the last time, we drove by a farmer's market in Ferguson to get to the place where he died in Ferguson, which is to say in St. Louis. King Louis is cast in bronze on a horse on a hill. His gaze casts itself off to all of the coasts. Joni Mitchell is sirening by the Niagara again, drawn to the idea of sound pouring out hard enough to roar if I were made up of water, which I am, I'd fall too. I'd listen at the banks like bank tellers on a morning smoke break, umbrellaless, straightforwardly huddling up against their stone wall as if good posture could solve anything, or was it everything? We went to the gay club dressed as the dead on the day of the dead because it's your birthday and lost the couple's costume contest to a slutty pair of brothers Mario. If I had as much pride as St. Louis pride, I'd be lions 
the first birth I remember was my guinea pigs in Tennessee. I remember it was right after seeing The Lion King. I want to absorb all of my creature comforts and emerge into a greater creature. I think of Mewtwo. I think of you too. All the phones are going off in the room, like a ghost call, all of them at once. This otherworldly prank means the dead are drunk, possibly forever. Thanks for holding just one moment. It's going to be silence that you hear. What an intoxicating dilemma, the rush at which one is required to act to realistically invent a brand new desire. The crease of my laptop pinches out a single thigh hair. My heart is trying to kill me. It's beating on the door. It's like, let me in. My farm burnt down. Now I raise dragons. Fold your wings. Unfold your wings. Take me to the tower. Um, and I'll, I was gonna, I'll read one more poem and it's, um, oh, I printed it, but it's in the other room. Um, I'll be right back. Okay. Uh, this, I, my friend um, told me to read something new, so I am, and I'm writing up, I wrote a series of poems that are, they're, um, they're based on the states, which is, I grew up in Canada, so it's what you call the United States, is the states, and each of the poems is for one of the states in our country, um, and this one is for Pennsylvania, which um, is important right now. <laughs> um, I took each of the names of the states and I, I came up with a new title that kind of sounds like them. Um, so this one is called, it's for Pennsylvania, it's called Pants on Enya, the singer, who I think is a really great singer, Enya. Um, okay. What would you bring to a desert island? I would bring a person with many tools on her utility tool belt. Fire takes a match. Why not one made in heaven? Blue fire leads elves through the dark forest. Blue fire, you are so normal to me. Barbecues turn you on. Me too. Why don't we fall in love? Why don't we? fall in love, that people go well when they're together is an idea. I love ideas because all of us together is one. I could never say where the wind gets to. Anarchy is always optimistic. I'm calling to find out when you'll be free. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, I like hadn't, I hadn't even really registered that these poems existed on the other side of some wall of time that we're in right now. I sort of forget that they are originally pre-pandemic poems, but now I guess they're kind of, they're just situated in constantly moving time. Um, I guess another way of thinking about time and location across the work of the three poets tonight is source text. And attendant with that is some attention to the subtext which surrounds these sources. The subtext, which is so often not textual at all, but the residues rather of different kinds of happening. Um, Claire Mushki's debut book, Upend, traces correspondence and consequence across several registers of time, engaging with the archived immigration trial of Hong An, a biracial Alaska Native Chinese man in 1912 on Angel Island during the Chinese Exclusion Act, as well as his mother, who is named Unknown Indian on his birth certificate, 
as well as his granddaughter, the poet, who is with us tonight. I notice in this book and in other more recently published poems of Mishki's I've been reading, this incredible multidimensionality of time brought to every unit of language, place names especially, but laws and other daily language matter as well. Everything is sort of flickering with her attention to past and future and their concentric linkages and the ways language, environment, people are all inhered within one another. Under the scrutiny of her work, we see all etymology, all grammar as both constitutive and reflective of imperial violence, of imprisonment, of deportation, but also of care, devotion, and possibility. And to all of this, she adds speech for what has been neglected or invisibilized, often willfully, within the materials which make up archive. Her poetry becomes the language site of documentation, recovery, dissection, counter logic, decreation, recreation, and it clings also to those gorgeous places of suspended unknowing and unfathomability too. It's really a great honor to welcome Claire Mieszki to the Poetry Project. Thank you so much, Kyle. That was really generous and I'm kind of still spinning from all of that and from Paul's gorgeous reading. Um, I feel really lucky to be nestled between Paul and Lara um, in this Zoom space. Um, so I started changing my mind about everything. I think I'm gonna read a new poem because I like that Paul did that. Um, and I have a draft I'm working on on my desk. So you're gonna get the first draft, so it probably won't sound or look like this in the future if there is a future for it. Um, and it's called End Up um, because I'm still writing in a way my first book, Up End, so I'm not finished with it. Red in the California landscape is traditionally the rarest, head feathers, blood, and so Poma women have woven red feathers into baskets when they bleed, fasting. Baskets for future food, the days are getting shorter, we begin to say. Bitter melon ends in a surprise of red flesh that pushes out red covered seeds. I imagine Chinese farmers and native land stewards comparing their love for red, how mass murder may have changed this. Steward, an English word not old enough. Any city goes cul-de-sac, highway, wall of cemetery, wall of cemetery, highway, cul-de-sac. Does love end when rarity is no longer perceived or is that when it starts? The wick of the candle I spent too much on gets buried in wax. The bee drones are all male, the result of the queen's unfertilized eggs. No life of nectar or pollen, existing just for the queens and the promise of female offspring. I revise my dream of pleasure, water droplets on walls, puddles on hardwood, Say you were there and caused it. Say you were there and we both stopped, startled at what I did. I wanted to be, a, be one of many pairs of legs lineated inside the representation of a dragon. I wanted to be a favorite boy when I cut my leg diving for the football on a road named for an English city. My infinity is a rusty seesaw screeching. I put the seeds to dry below the vanity mirror that has seen my grandfather, who I never saw, see himself. Look up what planet is out, why the bitter melon shapes itself that way. Make believe. Deadened nerves of a scar give the false feeling the, the surrounding skin feels more. Black-backed woodpeckers depend on the obscuring of charred bark. I can't eat when I harvest food from ash all day. My mother attends an online wedding for the son of her cousin's son, who is also her half-brother. When, when she says their names, it's in the tone of a question, hoping I don't remember them. Okay. 
Uh, let me see. I had a order for what I was going to read written down. Okay. I'm going to read a poem um, about Angel Island. So I, um, right now I'm in Oakland on a lonely land, um, but I wrote most of up end or all of it when I was living in the Southwest in Arizona and New Mexico. Um, so a lot of this book is filtered um, through the lens of the Southwest, which was really nurturing me at the time and um, offered me a kind of escape from the Bay Area. I was obsessed with the Bay Area and Angel Island and was dreaming about it, but um, didn't have to be there. And now that I'm here, it the, this text feels a little strange to me, but I'm going to just go for it because, yeah, Zoom feels strange also. Um, stunning Angel Island fire seen for miles. The military planted 24 acres of eucalyptus that expanded to 86 and invaded native plants. Chinese characters carved into a prison wall in the immigration station. Once you see the open net, why throw yourself in? It is only because of empty pockets I can do nothing else, unknown. Before historical, before conservationists, before the military, before quarantine, before the immigration station, what systems did the Miwok use for their livelihood? Livelihood, not survival. In 1915, the military introduced mule deer for recreational hunting. Surviving is everything after. Eucalyptus trees are highly flammable. Flaming debris from the island caused the Oakland fire in 1991 when I was a one-year-old. My family told stories about where, where they were that day, like the 1989 earthquake. My mother, pregnant with my brother and me, rolling a cart, canned food falling. A semicolon is clipped as a means to continue. The 1906 earthquake caused fires for days. Immigration files were destroyed. In 2008, residents described the flames as red, as orange, as yellow. Conclusion, the island was a fort and later an immigration station is now reachable, a popular picnicking and camping spot. In 2012, I danced in the bar with the old man who sang on the G train platform, dry mouth on mouth kiss I gave him, the eucalyptus pod from my coat pocket held for when I missed California, as invasive as it was. In 1993, California state parks discovered a market in Japan for eucalyptus mulch which reduced the cost of its removal. Prisoners from San Quentin labored over the burned slash piles. Garland for herbicide was applied to cut stumps. A federal plaque is the after image of a headstone. In 1775, Juan de Ayala named the island. He and his naval crew were the first Europeans to access it. In third grade, we learned about Christopher Columbus, and while the teacher talked, I could see the sliced Achilles heels infected, copper tokens around the necks for those who found gold. A ferry ticket cost $15 round trip. Put coins in the cemented down binoculars. See everything except the place itself. The scent of herbs is a plant screaming in flames. Just when you remark to yourself how temperate water feels, a little white snake wraps around your calf, a pattern of stable vortices, cinches its jaw to its own body. The snake is heavier than its visual mass. You try to swim up to the river's surface, but your head sinks with the image of fangs. The snake could be a metaphor for the patriarchy, easy now, a simmer, or an oil pipeline leaking venom into the Missouri River. But for now, the snake is a snake. No one tells you how lonely drowning is, the secret to painting a convincing glare. Add rosemary flowers at the end, collect droplets on the lid for neck and face. When you realize all your metaphors are literal, when you could be you or you or me, wasn't that you when all the children cried, put your, your face up to the dead rattlesnake? cut off the rattler you kept in a Ziploc, later moved to the closet to the trash when embarrassed. A boiling pot is water's maximum freedom. All right. 
This next one, um, I just, I dreamt that I was a white woman, woman and I was um, in the 19th century because that was all the, I guess, archival material I was looking at at the time. Two figures travel by foot during the 19th century, bird's eye view of tiny settlements along a river. I become the woman. My husband has his arm around my waist, sweeping me almost across the ground. We're white and fleeing from some mistake. He begins painting my nails bright red. I am annoyed at how they look, clumped and on my finger skin. I fear someone will notice I'm not her. This is me living or not living, the idiom, blood on our hands. 19th century colonial women suffered nationally a leg paralysis. Western science called it psychosis. What about immobilizing guilt, organized resistance, the land not wanting you? Um, this next poem I wrote when I was working for the Forest Service um, in a town in New Mexico. An iridescent stone I don't recall the name of. You haven't shot a gun before. Pictures of galaxies and not having to be there. Minerals Tech insisted on picking me up in his ram, mug with tricolor, geometric wolves, show me around, cross Colorado, we ran over a sparrow, I read as the word sorrow. Rainbows of any am amplitude, rainbow in the sink. The sparrow trapped his exhaust, unopened letter from a dear friend. He entered a dirt road toward a bluff, all beige, dried blue, greenery, sage and juniper, blue all above that sometimes hurt to look. Fair degree steeples, statues, sweat under a heavy coat thrift collar button-ups, winter sun, dark in my face, red reeds against teal river. I held his pistol, heavier than expected, shot at a bottle like a protagonist, though I was more extra or dwindling river, glass dump yard, antique oil swirl, a year signed away on government sheets, expected to see the bullet trajectory as the result of my trigger. He took a piss in plain sight, Declarative shirts, you go girl. Earlier, I stumbled down to a parched riverbed, wildcat canyon road, flamboyant socks, enough space enclosed, rot scent of a deer before I saw her ribs, squatted on my good leg, other extended, visible weather to talk about place, distance, a cloud streaks down a mountaintop. Fire management officer told him to look out for me, sure to be a heartbreaker, Loose tea, a variety of petals, could probably drink any man under the table. Said I was not interested. Cartoon fruit depictions. Don't worry, you're not that special. Six fray ends, stringed instrument, a lover coiled once. He dropped me off, red L-shaped apartment complex. Two-storied, must have been a motel before, when oil flowed essential oil aisle and not buying anything. I lived ground floor, pinned in the hinge of ankle, upstairs neighbor, every finger broken, hardly looked like hands. Listened to hey, must be the money over and over. Knocked my door, he knew I lived alone, tried to enter when he was loaded. I cooked dinner in a 45 pound vest to pass the fire test. 100 push-ups a day and no safer, hot and sour soup, Whittier, lily, flower, black fungus, my mother sent, afraid of landlock. How I posed to correct my limp, wanted to possess the soft of a horse mouth and all that power. Um, so right now my I have a different upstairs neighbor and he told me recently that he's learning how to sing and play guitar. So I keep hearing him play yesterday by the Beatles over and over and it's kind of haunting me um, but it's not as bad as the southern neighbor so things are improving um, okay get well soon the room is brass and amber and green men statuesque look like there's live music 
there's no live music. Commodity, I'm unworthy. Boys throw pennies at me, the fountain. Hold your breath until you're out of the tunnel that is a double rainbow you want with your eyes to be under. I smell normal candles on any day and think of the birthday we didn't have that year of the snake horse in Albuquerque. Everyone seemed to wish everyone would get home safe. I was on crutches and a guy with his beer glazed mouth took my fingers to his jeans to push them against the metal bolt in his shin to say it could be worse. Okay, I'm just gonna read one more poem. Um, it's called Census and it was more of a coping mechanism where I was collaging Sherwin-Williams paint names um, together. Um, I think Kyle did a good job at introducing me so I don't have to say too much, but my, my great grandmother was named Unknown Indian on my grandfather's birth certificate. So I'm often like looking for traces of my ancestors in very racist documents. So this, um, this was a sort of healing process. Um, and the paint color names have numbers attached to them, but I'm not gonna read them. Restrained gold, mossy gold, harvest gold, ancestral gold, monarch gold, old world gold, golden rod, marigold, golden gate, golden plumeria, quilt gold, folksy gold, edgy gold, vintage gold, escapade gold, independent gold, humble gold, different gold, relic bronze, chivalry copper, artifact, reliable white, original white, intimate white, moderate white, welcome white, nice white, reserved white, everyday white, high reflective white, paper white, modest white, divine white, free spirit, polite white, spatial white, Indian white, Chinese red, red scent, reddened earth, agreeable gray, suitable brown, well-bred brown, rugged brown, nearly brown, less brown, resort tan, colonial revival tan, colonial yellow, new colonial yellow, chopsticks, diverse beige, neutral ground, adaptive shade. Okay, thanks everyone. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, Paul and Claire, for your readings. Um, I'm really, uh, I feel really um, honored to get to introduce Laura Mimosa Montez tonight, whose book, Thresholds, if you don't already have, I couldn't recommend more. Um, when I sat down to write an intro, I could only write a love letter. Better. So that's what, that's what we have. That's what we have. Dear Laura, I made myself a big purple sweet potato tonight, steamed in the oven in a foil wrapped cast iron, then cut in quarters and browned against butter. It's the first sweet potato I can remember cooking in a very long time. And I made it with the memory of you here on a research visit for this book, steaming sweet potatoes in my Nostrand Avenue apartment on my mind. The body's will and chance to prepare something for itself, inside out, outside in, nutrition, digestion, puzzle. I miss sharing food with you and the intimate ways you find to call me crazy that 
feel like love. I know I maybe took it a step further than you would have with all that butter, but you know I love this exorbitant restraint toward health and understanding you practice in all your wildness, this undisciplined, this disciplined unraveling, this sharp excavation, this throne rendering, your books. No doubt, this is a love letter. Since we first sat across from each other at a seminar table at the Graduate Center, I've always been hot for your quickness, your sidling easy, your swerving libidinal editorial muscle. I've always felt faith in your leaps, felt most in the stories I audited as your friend of over a decade, as your admirer, as your mutually ecstatic interlocutor, just to ven a little with you. Sitting as your reader with this book, this big grief, these intercut scales of trauma and loss, Bon and Malmo slid and stuttered through these sweet holes, these obscene gaps that could be gunshot laughs or gut punches, knives. I press record on my phone when we talk to discover what we believe later on because it matters that much. It matters that much the way you write the question, from what dimension and perspective do you communicate? with what instrument, to and for and with whom. This fractal beloved, uncle, friend, lover, mother, keeper, you carry and transmit and remit through your writing. That is you and not you in all these important directions. Your writing is a body full of blood that verges on what borders and what consumes. Poetry in a photograph of you in a legend's bathroom, your history's rubbing. Poetry, a posture, a giving way to formal question in relation. I'm going to study for so long just how you remain generous toward narrative, even as the fragment becomes the whole and the wholeness of the fragment makes everything a verge, everything that drifts in or ebbs up or waves down a beautiful, terrible signal. Your person and your writing have electric ways of talking about in the voice of, of getting into place and memory and literature and art that makes life more real. Your generosity is uncompromising in how hard it comes down on what the fuck is going on with the meaning of the question, the word, the line, the image, the condition, the status or the state of the body as substantial as any story. Thresholds is an amazing fucking book that teaches as it learns, submits as it dominates, vows and promises as it equivocates and pacifies, undoes and undoes and does into that quantum of your specific brilliance, your light. You write the forces that wish to be written and these forces become an undone sum. You, your desire, you. I will always want to be here for the lesson blessing of being read by our own books until the present throbs open and circular, present past, past present. Going to love you and your writing forever. Your friend, SJ. Um, thanks, Sarah. <laughs> I'm just so, like, I'm feeling the love um, and also feeling the missing because I haven't been to New York since December and that's not quite a year ago. So I'm in Minneapolis. I'm technically outside of Minneapolis um, in Brooklyn Center. Just gonna make sure my camera's good. My staging's good. Um, so I miss my friends and Sarah Jane, um, a friend of the poetry project and a friend to me for so long. And it's really impossible to like imagine myself without that friendship. Um, and so thanks for that introduction um, and that love and that love letter. I receive it. Um, I need my friends. I feel a little like weird and friendless in Brooklyn Center. Um, um, so I'm just, you know, your book is here with me. 
your first book is here with <laughs> me and I await your, your next one. Um, thanks to Claire and thanks to Paul. <sighs> new friends, old friends, new wine, old bottles. This is great. Thanks to Poetry Project and um, everyone who's here. I do love to see the chat pop up um, with all my friends, internet friends and all. So I'm here, we're here. I'll read from Thresholds and um, I'll read a couple of poems, noting the time is almost eight. I'm just looking forward to being with people. It's very strange to like have a poetry reading in Brooklyn Center that's Poetry Project because I always think of the Poetry Project as this like force like St. Mark's and having been to so many readings at St. Mark's over the years I'd be like oh I haven't been in New York in almost a year I feel like temporally like elastic um so this is awesome to have people like kind of in my living room and well not technically in the room in my office in Brooklyn Center um you know like in my house and in my psyche like I wonder what dreams this will this will lead to tonight our lady of the flowers I studied in the museum and erogenous form and then at home I studied my own zinc rubber flesh and core when I think again about your body and yours and yours. I know I am held by the roseate swarm and where I am at a door, I might in facing the bull finally face myself. But what if a hole is not an absence so much as it is a space, one reserve space without time, space even more than time. Try to recognize the dotted lines as I divine one shape. Will it speak or will it swerve? Daily, I remind myself the future is not dependent on your inability to describe your undoing. In the red notebook, I carry always a blank 25 cent postcard of Silver Rock, Cannon Beach, Oregon, a small black and white photograph of a cattle crossing taken from behind the dashboard of a car facing the oncoming cattle caravan, and another postcard featuring an image of the seaside city of Atami, part of Asako Narahashi's series Half Awake and Half Asleep in the Water. The barren coastal scene captured in the postcard of Silver Rock resembles the beaches of Ingmar Bergman's The Seven Seal and suggests despair of a spiritual origin while the other's oncoming catastrophe by way of some fatal accident such as death by stampede or drowning. I have never to the best of my recollection been subject to a Rorschach test, not as a child, nor as an adult, but trust that if there's a life for me to be lived between these images, then these words would be my attempt to describe it, that which fails to coalesce a form and the chalk that outlines the holes. In Jack Garfine's Brock's Noir, Something Wild, Mary Ann experiences a sexual assault at St. James One night in March, on her way home from a course practice, Mary Ann Robinson was raped by an assailant whose features she could not make out in the darkness. The novel revolves around this trauma that Mary Ann cannot. Am I now so tired? It's mid October, but I refuse to believe I'm suffering from. me off guard have you been to nearby if not go there
sudden internal rearranging of the parts, but this is not at all cinematic, I thought. Aside from the film, I had no memory of this place that was once a low marshland before it was graded with ash and soil and then transformed into a park. Now an accumulation of garbage, litter, and glass or that which you cannot expel. These, the shards, as if by sorting through it, I could finally say this is why that happened. This is how I got here, that ligament torn. It was not an address to which I wished to return. The day I first met H, I ordered over $30 worth of food at a nearby cafe. What I ate is unmemorable, save for what I drank, a soda of rosemary, spruce, juniper, and sage. Can I trust H to help me or am I too far gone? I took another sip of my drink and thought of Apon Kawara. I am still alive. But feeling alive was causing me problems. The past few months I had become increasingly disturbed by the idea that I did not deserve to live, not because I didn't want to try, but because I imagined I wasn't very good at it, to which H would respond, say more about that. I had never been a happy person. I had just been, and for whatever reason, just being felt inadequate. Then R died, R with whom I danced, R with whom I once lived, he was the same R who continued to seek me out, even as I acted towards him somewhat distant and uncertain. After R died, away went my focus. I didn't lack the words so much as feel overwhelmed by their direction. Where were they carrying me? And what if I was not ready to follow? You are where your ghost lives. Sometimes living in two places at once, Minnesota and New York, caused me to feel as though I did not live anywhere because no one ever knew where I was. Around the waiting, but before the alarm. Upon rewatching Something Wild, I hit pause to consider the image of Marianne's cross and the crisis of loss. How a violation can sever the soul from the body and make ruin where there was once a sense of belief, beauty, in an interview, the director, Jack Garfine, says his ambition is to depict through his film the experience of a person who has undergone a trauma. Unable to recall Garfine's exact words, I oscillate between verbs, undergone, underwent, suffered. I'm not confident in the ways I want to describe or in the ways I try to remember. I hesitate over my desire to connect with others, particularly Mary Ann, a fictional character with actual feelings. I stuttered at the thought, and abridge the text. What if we are part of the black and blue, the changing angle of the sun? I began to feel a persistent misalignment in my face. Stop eating so many raw almonds, sit up straight, buy a bike card, meditate. When I tried to describe this sensation to others, I felt very inept. I used words like broken and asymmetrical, but my jaw feels out of place, I complained. In the mirror, it appeared deviated. So on the recommendation of an acupuncturist, I made an appointment with S who specializes in intraoral um, neuromuscular massage therapy. Oh my goodness. I have a very strange, funny thing. My book has like leapt in time. So that's page five. That's page four. This is page six. Okay. Uh, we met a few weeks later in an exam room at a clinic I sometimes visited. Have you ever experienced a trauma? She asked. It was such a direct question I had to recalibrate. Did she mean specifically in regards to my face? Like a car accident? No. She then stepped out so I could have a few minutes alone to undress. I lay face up on the heated table and pulled the sheet up as far as it would go. Naked from the waist up, I felt embarrassed and also tense. Her question gave me pause. Had something happened to me once? S entered the room again. Do you mind the music, a binaural tone, then a swerve? Like symbols, the touching, like symbols, the touching was percussive. I registered its movement, a bilateral progression. Why is this like drugs? I could hardly hear myself. The words were so slurred. Face up once again, I felt certain parts of me fall back, allowing others to reveal themselves. S continued to work the muscles surrounding the temporal mandibular joints in and around the mouth. It was as though through touch, S had activated some deep prehistoric reflex in my cells that many lifetimes ago and in another form may have once been employed via venom producing like glands whose presence I suspected based on the profound chemical changes they precipitated. 
When I attempted to describe this experience to H, he said, it sounds like you are relaxed. I laughed, I guess, but it was so much more dynamic than that. My body was like the meeting point between two screens made of mesh, the point at which they connect. It never felt like writing and it never felt like sex, a sensation of the parts falling away and peeling back. It was as if I were immobilized by a spontaneous flood of snake blood, saliva, proteins, and polypeptides. And upon the lee the morning after I was thrown. S had this manner of bringing me to the edge of my pain so that no matter what I had experienced a session before, I was still able to return and continue in the work, even when certain sensations were upon the lightest palpation unbearable. I was motivated by curiosity more than anything. How would I change if I allowed myself to turn towards the pain rather than live in constant aversion of it? What followed felt like the fulfillment of some necessary spiritual obligation. By doing the work I am learning that in order to live, I have to learn how to transition from one state to the next, how to become nerve gas, hematoxin and snake again, to be without clarity, to write out of focus. The summer before you died, I saw Ivy Baldwin's Keen number two at the Abrams Art Center Playhouse. And while you have been dead almost a year and the space of grief is so long, it feels strange to admit that I've been thinking about this one particular dance work for longer than you have not been on this earth. How can I go back to before this time? I imagine H answers, you can't. To Keen is to cry in mourning or lamentation, to weep without words. The custom ritualizes a grief that is multiple choral and feminine in form. As someone who cries more often than she would like and deeper than those around me know what to do with, I take comfort in the fact that keening is an Irish mourning tradition rather than or not exclusively a symptom of an emotional or feminine adjacent defect childishness, hysteria, excess, estrogen, and so on. In key number two, a dance that comprises various solos, duets, and structured improvisations, the space of mourning is suffused with light, tantric and expansive. It's a beautiful tribute to Lawrence Casella, Baldwin's longtime friend and dance company member who died of HLH, a rare autoimmune disease in 2015. When asked about the grief that accompanies the obvious shifts in her creative process, Baldwin recalls, it was the only thing I could make anything about. What if you don't replace this person? What if you live there and embrace that whole? What if inside the black and blue is us? The moment I saw the sea, not the land. When I met up with Justin Jones in Minneapolis to talk about the score he wrote for key number two, he described the collaboration with Baldwin as one guided by intuition and a shared interest in digging through movement to find resonance. I consider that resonance alongside the sonic elements of the work, which range from the minimal to the otherworldly. The oral intensities, dilations, and sense of wonder that emerge alongside the choreography and maybe even co-produce it are part of the ritual of keening rather than an amplification of it. In other words, the movement is part of the sound and the sound part of the movement, its pulse, to use Joan's words. Together they form the language of the elegy and ecstatic coursing through. And then we rotated in the blue light of April. On the phone, I speak with A, who I met years ago in New York, but now lives in Vermont, somewhere remote. She tells me about her house and her new cat, Gloria, and a party on July 4th. We also speculate about perception, how we discover a person, their mannerisms, and come to know what governs them. We are not talking about actual people. A is a novelist, so we're really talking about characters, which are knowable in ways that real people are not. She asked me if I've ever considered the possibility that a person acts the way they do because they have experienced at a young age a knowledge producing event. I laugh because it is very A of her to ask this kind of question. That's elegant, I say. No, it's never occurred to me to describe a knowledge producing event as anything other than a trauma. In the space between question and answer, I wondered what series of knowledge producing events might have structured my friend's query so unique and considerate of the unknowable experience of, his, of others. It's okay not to know everything. I conclude that the nature of our friendship is such that were I ever to inquire about these events, the confirmation of their having happened would never be as interesting as the person I may or may not know as A. 
felt the fracture widen, the blue intervals open. So I ran towards the sex. I threw myself at the stars. Among those highly stylized ruins, I felt my legs go numb. Walk it off, I thought. I ended up at an exhibition of the painter Mary Weatherford the day before it closed. Initially, after a few minutes in the gallery, I felt disappointed. The paintings were large, formally interesting and abstract. At their most beautiful, they reminded me of graffiti, irresponsible and committed, unexpected. And yet for the most part, these paintings, despite the fact that they were illuminated by their neon parts, did not emanate light, not from within anyway, except for one, Gloria. It was soft, haphazard, glowing. I immediately recalled 1980 Gina Rollins, the various mauves, pinks, and satins she wears throughout the film. A beautiful character study, I thought, and left the show satisfied. I later confirmed it was actually the painting next to this painting that was Gloria, the one I so admired was soft pink copper eagle. I licked the brine that clouds my looking. When I ask S during a session what drew her to the work, she replies the layers. Body as geological record, strata, rock, action. These, the shards. Tissue lets you discover it. And when it can, it gives way, yielding new impressions. In orienting my attention towards the body, its histories as well as its cellular capacities, S is teaching me how to reconsider my own formlessness. The ways my body and my person has been bound, unleashed, divided, and reborn. What it knows is older than I am. What it holds and gives of itself is more than I could ever recount. It was as if I had been scored somewhere below the surface. Months had passed, I could think of nothing but love. Months had passed, I could think of nothing but loss. These are the sensations I wanted to chase. They are not always recognizable to me, the forms they take or what, if anything, is meaningful about their particular expression, apart from the fact that our acknowledgement of them through touch often leaves me mangled and estranged. We fled into what had not yet been written in search of a deadbolt, a grammar, a thought, a door. What if all that's left of me are the holes? When I say I had this sensation of us welding the parts, I'm trying to communicate that in me and in us, something was becoming fused where it had once been torn. When heat was applied along the body's fault lines, plates that were broken began to realign and the beautiful blueness of the world broke through. And S would remark, we went somewhere we never went before, in memory of that knowing whose presence was. What if the only face of desire I recognize is loss? I woke up a little after 4 a.m., frustrated by the sensation in my left arm. This is fucking crazy to me because I still have this fucking sensation in my arm. I think I'm like approaching some like, like, relationship to it that's different than what I'm writing about here but I can't believe like literally I woke up at five today being like fucking arm like is it herpes zoster is it like an old virus is it the nerves dying or the nerves regenerating um I think they're regenerating I think I can say that um I'm reading from Thresholds, by the way, so I'm almost done. This is the um, excerpt that appears in Fence. Um, so if you want to find it, it's called The Moment I Saw the Sea, Not the Land. I woke up a little after 4 a.m. frustrated by the sensation in my left arm. It wasn't asleep exactly. That feeling was familiar enough, but it did feel less available, less present than the other parts. What is happening to me? It was as if I were a snake and I had two skins. My old skin was stretching to make room for the new one. And as the new one grew, learned to flex and take shape, it rubbed against the dead tissue, the sloth, also known as the exuviae. Scientists call this process exedesis. It can take anywhere from seven to 14 days. Um, Never handle a snake that shows signs of an impending shed or is actively shedding, the internet warns. First, I was filled with dread. I'm dying. Then paranoia. <laughs> when are metaphors useful and when are they not? Maybe I had not taken enough B12 or maybe I had overzealously taken too much and what I was experiencing was not some deep metaphysical change but actually nerve damage over these one and the same and I recalled something choreographer Michelle Goulet had said to me once, we can't predict what forms healing will take. 
I rubbed my forearm, afraid of this process, its waywardness. The temporary experience of feeling cognitively rearranged was not always terrible. Sometimes rather than ask, ask too many questions, I would silently observe and appreciate the ways my suffering would change, particularly the moments when I didn't feel numb so much as disinterested in my own pain, the drama that it wrought. Could I be this accepting always? We gathered so many marigolds like belief, like light, foraging into the word. When I tried to do away with language and long periods without writing commence, I began to feel sick. Imagine trying to unburden yourself daily of a secret that is not really yours to know or to give away. I struggled to write about their holes and their capacity to produce in me a shift. Near the end, I visited R in the hospital. One minute I was in the wrong elevator, the next minute the wrong floor. What is he doing here? When, he had, when we had last spoken on the phone, maybe a week or so earlier, the boundaries separating this word from that one began to erode and several minutes would pass when I could not understand him because wherever this new astral shaped tumor was, it was pressing upon a place of importance, thankfully not the place where a person's intent lives, but near the body's willful expression of it. In other words, R was still R, but as he spoke, the words were like a language made out of melted parts. Who do we have to be in each moment to be what the other wants when being oneself can never feel good enough? Now go ahead and tilt your head back. Imagine the line as a load bearing wall. According to Judith Butler to force someone to speak in a manner that does not honor improvisation or the unconscious is to do a violence to that person. In these instances, we may also unknowingly perpetuate a violence we have already committed against ourselves. In John Cassavetti's 1977 film, Opening Night, an actress named Myrtle Gordon, performed by the imitable Gina Rollins, is preparing for the Broadway premiere of the play within the play, The Second Woman, but struggles to act her part as everyone else in the film insists she must. As her behavior becomes increasingly erratic, it becomes difficult to distinguish whether Myrtle's gradual undoing is an effect of her circumstances or an inevitable, inevitable byproduct of the actress's process. Depending on my mood, I sometimes envy not so much Myrtle's stardom as her ability to improvise and as a professional embrace what is unpredictable and not knowable in advance, what falls outside narrative as well as that which cannot be subdued to narrative ends. What I hold moves me so that I am breathless agitating the fibers where the smooth muscle contracted. I cannot yet say if all this doing was enough, so how can you know me without my being threatened by that knowing? I never liked the words so much as the ability to make meaningful the sensations, their hands plastering me with substrate, colostrum, milk, earthquake, magnet. I'll read one more um, short one, and then, you know, we'll break, we'll break out, see where we end up. Postcards from Puerto Rico. At 2.04 p.m. I witnessed a cloud form. By 2.05 it was gone. Were I to recall the circumstances under which I saw that cloud, then I would recall my reasons for leaving. And yet a part of me still lives here. You want to know which part and whether or not this part can speak about the present. What does this composition tell you about the history of colonialism, about beauty, sightseeing, and the conventions of creating a place for the purposes of leisure, relaxation, exotic adventure, or one's diasporic identification with and attachment to loss? In my dream about Felix Gonzalez Torres, I say this is not about representation. Then what is it about? The one car is a Ford Maverick year unknown, the red a Chevy, what do these details tell you, if anything, about a place or my emotional state today, somewhere between a clinical depression and a tropical depression? 10 June, 2018. Despondent to have realized the words I write are not the ones you will read. As one of the postcards from Ponce states, temp 83 degrees, warm and breezy, hot and sunny. If every postcard is a site specific work, then this is the work that memory does. And whereas I have the distinct feeling I should recognize this place, I don't, I can't. We remember what we can substituting one place for another, one color for another, to say nothing of where we came from and the way we relate to El Tiempo, the past. 
Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. It's so amazing to listen to these three poets. Um, Laura said, we fled into what had not yet been written. Claire said, no one tells you how lonely drowning is. Paul said, everything changes everything. Um, I love listening to these poems. I love the rhythm of this reading of like enraptured listening followed by ecstatic admiration in the chat. It's really sweet and makes me feel like we're in some kind of listening space together, which we are. Um, we're gonna leave the Zoom open for 10 minutes. So until like 9.33, folks are welcome to turn on their cameras, turn on their microphones, talk, chat. Um, if people are reticent or withholding and it feels like we're gonna shut the Zoom off earlier, we'll do that too. But we'll, we'll keep this space open for 10 minutes. Um, our next readings are on Wednesday, live at St. Mark's in person outside with Shade Lene and Pamela Sneed. And that will be streamed on Facebook Live also. And then on uh, Thursday, actually, we have a discourse with Jason P. Smith, consider the omnivore uh, anxiety mess and what is it? Consumption anxiety mess as imagination. And then on Friday, um, Kazim Ali will be reading with the incredible vocal performer, Charmaine Lee. Uh, so there's a bunch coming up and we'll keep the chat open. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Sarah Jane also for your beautiful introduction. Take care. <laughs>